quite what that means. But it seems to indicate that it was it was he. It was his personality that was the healing, not the not the secret names of God or not some esoteric tradition he had. So this went on, and uh, and the uh, success of Hasidism had a lot to do with that kind of popular healing and uh, and, and 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 popular teaching. So Nachman settles in this town, Medvedevka. There's a local tzaddik in the next town. He's called the Shpola Zeta, the old man of Shpola. And he had been a shamus in the synagogue and started performing miracles, and then people began to venerate him as a Hasidic Rebbe. And Nachman attacked him fiercely, denounced him as a fraud, tried to, tried to get people away from him, and got himself into a lot of trouble. Needless to say, a young man coming into a new area where he hadn't been before, where people are comfortable with this kind of, with this kind of popular religion. Nachman tries to show people it's nonsense and doesn't quite convince them. So already he's in, he's in a conflict situation. He's in conflict with his uncle. He's in conflict with his brother Zayda. And very few people gather around him. Very small group. Maybe half a dozen, a dozen disciples by the time, by the time he's, uh, he's, he, he's at that stage of his life. And he makes a demand of them like a demand nobody else made in Hasidism. If you want to become my disciple, he said, you have to come to me and confess to me all the sins of your life. Uh, it sounds more Catholic than Jewish to you, I know you immediately think, but there was an old tradition going back to the Middle Ages of Vidui Lefnei Talmit Chacham, going to a sage and confessing. And Nachman insisted on confession. And uh, everything, everything from childhood on that you can remember. And the idea was, of course, that I can, I can relieve you of their burden. How could he relieve them of their burden? The idea was that anything you have been through, anything you have suffered, any guilt you have, any doubt you have, Nachman has had worse, and he has overcome it. And therefore, when he takes your suffering onto him, he's able to take it away from you, absorb it himself, he's the great shock absorber, and he can, he can, he can remove it from you, and he can bear the burden. It is, in a certain sense, a religion of vicarious atonement, vicarious suffering and vicarious atonement. He can, he can take it all on. So who's attracted to a Rebbe like that? People with a lot of burdens, with a lot of suffering. In other words, people like him. Um, he, takes on, he takes on disciples who have the need for him to be their wounded healer. And that's who he is. He's the original wounded healer. The stories of his uh, childhood that I read you a couple of paragraphs of, they continue into his adulthood. Sometimes Nachman says that uh, he's the greatest tzaddik of all time. And sometimes he says, I'm just a simple man, leave me alone, I don't know anything. Uh, my friend Svi Mark in Israel has written a book called Mysticism and Madness in Rabbi Nachman. He's the mystic who seems to flirt with the edge of psychosis. Was he a manic depressive? It's a possibility. He certainly had moods of great elation and moods of great devastation. But we don't have him on the couch in front of us and we therefore can't, uh, can't, can't make any declarations about his mental state. The point is, he did great things with it. Um, out of this, out of a life of great suffering, he created what you would say is great art. Um, and we can think of other artists like that we know. And uh, well, today you might cure him with lithium. You would, uh, you would lose a great deal of what of what Reb Nachman offered the world, as you would with various other artists. Nachman creates a new kind of religious language in Hasidism. There's, there are terms used in Breslov that are not used in any other Hasidic works. Hasidism is a religion that's devoted to joy. The Baal Shem Tov insisted on joy. Serving God with joy is what you're supposed to do. 
Rav Nachman says, yes, joy is absolutely right. You have to be joyous all the time, but you have to struggle to achieve the joy. Because the natural tendency of a person, that was his own experience, was to be drawn to melancholy. And so you have to fight off that melancholy in order to, in order to pursue a life of joy. You have words used in Breslov like ga'aguim, longings, the longing for God. You don't find it in other Hasidism. You have the word miniot, obstacles. What are the great obstacles of faith? You have to overcome obstacles, which are to say doubt and, uh, and questioning. You have to overcome obstacles to come to God. Because in Breslov, in Nachman's thought, God is both near and far. He's brought up with a Hasidic faith that God is everywhere. The Baal Shem Tov and his Baal Shem Tov's disciples are quasi-pantheists, panentheists. God is in everything. The divine presence is to be found everywhere. And Nachman says, I looked, but sometimes God wasn't there at all. And he has to account for the absence of God in his life. He's the first Hasidic figure, maybe one of the first modern Jewish figures, still in a life of faith, to deal with this question of the absence of God. How do you live in a world where you can't find God? And that struggle, that struggle to assert that God is there, even though I experience God's absence, I know nevertheless that God is really there. And God is there, God is there across the great abyss of divine absence. And how do you, learning how to cross that abyss, learning how to maintain faith, even in the, even in the face of a sense of God's, of God's absence, that becomes an essential part of, an essential part of Nachman's teaching. So he be- Excuse me, he begins to get together, gather a small group of disciples. They are remarkably close to him. Others look at that and say, maybe, maybe there's something wrong there. He says the disciples like branches of the tree, that Sadik is the tree and they are and they are his branches. I think you read you read some of that again in chapter four. And um he begins to offer teachings to them. Nachman's teachings, uh, the great work of Brasil of Hasidism is the collected teachings, Likutei Maran, the collected teachings of our master Nachman. These were teachings he offered orally, like most Hasidic teachings, they were oral and then they were written down in books afterwards. His teachings are unlike the teachings of any other Hasidic master. He, it's, it's, almost, it's almost free association. He takes some very puzzling text out of the rabbinic corpus, usually some fantastic story from the Talmud, and tries to, uh, tries to reinterpret it. And he pulls together verses from all kinds of biblical places and all kinds of rabbinic passages. He was incredibly learned. And we don't know who his teachers were. He apparently was an autodidact, as far as we can tell. There's nobody who, there's no school he went to, there's nobody who was known to be his teacher. His uncle, Rebarach, the Hasidic Rebbe, did not know a hundredth of what Nachman knew in terms of ability to gather sources. So somewhere in his own study, he just learned tremendous, tremendous amount. He would bring forth all, he would bring out a, pass, a, a verse from Job and a verse from Proverbs and all kinds of obscure biblical texts. And uh, the whole rabbinic corpus he knew very well. You can see that he, he weaves things together, but he weaves things together in a in, as I say, an almost free association kind of way. This word sounds like that, and this reminds me of something else, and this is the category of that, and this is related to that, and, and when it's all woven together, you understand where he's going, but it's, um, it's a complex and, uh, and uh, not, uh, not ordinary weave of teachings. Um, he did that he, for th- four years or so, Again, taking on disciples around 1802, 1803, for three or four years, he has a little group of disciples who offer his teachings. And then some great sense of urgency happened around the year 1806. Remember, he died in 1810. We're talking about a very short life, very short career. Around 1806, some great sense of urgency overwhelms him. His wife was already ill with tuberculosis. He probably noticed the first signs of his own tuberculosis, which was, of course, a major killer in that, in that period. Coughing, blood, and so on. It was very, very, very apparent. 
That same year, he finally had a son. He'd had three daughters or four daughters. Finally, he had a son, Shlomo Ephraim. He decided that son was going to be the Messiah, or Messiah was going to come from that son. Tremendous elation when that son was born, and then the son died within a year, and, uh, and he was left. Something was wrong. Something had to change. Uh, 1806, in Hebrew, Taksav, Taksav, Taf Kuf Samech Vav, which is the year, which is the year 566. And if you count it up numerically, 566 is equivalent to the words Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah, the son of Joseph, who was supposed to come and be martyred before the great Messiah comes. So that was the year he figured out, that was the year of Mashiach ben Yosef. Was he Mashiach ben Yosef? Was this child who died Mashiach ben Yosef? What was the relationship between that Messiah and the final Messiah? Why wouldn't the Messiah come? Why do these things happen? Why do we, why do we suffer? Why are we still in exile? And he says the reason, the reason we are still in exile, you'll read more of this, I hope, when you read the chapter on the tales in here for next week. The reason we are still in exile is because we can't imagine what it is to be redeemed. We don't have the imagination that we need to carry forward. Early texts of Reb Nachman, he talks about the imagination as the enemy of the truth. You have to know the, you have to know the truth and overcome the imagination. The imagination is the evil urge, the powers of the imagination. Your fantasy life, in other words, is what leads you to sin. But then he turns it around this particular year and says, no, what you have to do is fight imagination with imagination. Nothing can overcome the power of the imagination. It's so great. But if we could have a pure imagination, if we could have a new imagination, then maybe we could transform our own inner lives, our own imaginative faculty. And thus he begins to tell his stories. The first story, which we'll read next week, the Avidat Bat Melech, the, king's, the, 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 the loss of the king's daughter, is, um, is told in 1806. And he says, I'm going to tell you these stories because they are going to purify your imagination. In other words, if you want fantasy, I'm going to give you fantasy. But I'm going to give you a more beautiful and elaborate fantasy than anything that's in your minds. And that fantasy is somehow going to transport you to a different, to a different place and prepare you for the great redemption that's coming. And so he starts telling the stories. He continues teaching. The teachings and the stories go side by side. But, but Nachman begins to turn to this, new, to this new device of teaching, which is teaching by story. Now, storytelling was not original to Nachman. There are stories throughout the Hasidic corpus. The Baal Shem Tov told stories. But those stories are mostly parables. They reveal something of the story of the, of the, of, of the king who had a son. And then it's obviously God is the father and Israel is the son. It's sort of clear. Or there's stories about great tzaddikim and the wonderful things they did. Nachman's stories are about, as you'll see, bewitched princesses and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and wandering beggars and people who aren't necessarily Jewish. There's nothing particularly Jewish about the stories. They're fantasy world stories. Um, but these fantasy world stories were taken to have to be somehow filled with, filled with profound secrets. And if you understood the stories, that would somehow transform and purify your imagination. So Nachman, uh, Nachman passes the stories on to his disciples. And, um, and then he gets sicker. He um, eventually goes to consult doctors, which he didn't believe in, thought he shouldn't, thought he should rely on faith alone. But he goes to doctors in Lemberg, and they are not able to cure him. He has uh, a number of charming attacks on the medical profession that you may find, some of you may find particularly interesting. He says that the, uh, the, um, the angel of death is very busy and he can't go around to attend to everything he has to do, so he hires certain assistants <laughs> called Doctairim who, uh, who do his work for him. Um, and, um, and then in 1809, just the year before his death, he made a very interesting move. He left the... He had settled in Brest.
The town is called Bratislav in Ukrainian. It's not Bratislava, and it's not Breslau, it's Bratislav. Um, it's Bratislav, but the, but the Hasidim insist that not, not saying Bratislav, but Breslav. Why Breslav? Because if you do it with a Samach, if you do it with a Sin instead of a Tzadi, you can reverse the letters and get Lev Basar. In Breslav you can get a harder, you can, you can lose your heart of stone and get a heart of flesh, uh, as the prophet said. So, so he and he decides to move to the bigger town of Uman. Um, Uman is uh, because some 30 years earlier there had been a terrible massacre of Jews in Uman called the Gunter Massacres and there was a cemetery there where thousands of Jewish martyrs had been buried. And he said he wanted to go to Uman before he died to be buried with the, with the, with the martyrs of Uman. But he gets to Uman. Maybe he knew this before he went. We're not sure. He gets to Uman. And in Uman he meets Maskilim. This is 1810. 1810, the very first appearance of modernity is happening among Ukrainian Jews. Remember, Napoleon comes to Russia. Remember, Napoleon has defeated the gates of Moscow in 1812. You all know the 1812 overture. And... Um, the, even though Napoleon had betrayed the French Revolution, the ideas of the French Revolution came with the Napoleonic forces across Europe. And those ideas included the emancipation of the Jews. And people by the first decade of the 19th century were beginning to read uh, bits of Western, of Western literature. Um, Jews, uh, educated Jews began to learn German, began to learn Russian, and began to read kinds of things, things that Jews had never read before. And in 1810, when Nachman moves to uh, Uman, 1809, when Nachman moves to Uman, there's a maskil uh, named, uh, named Rappaport. He rents a room in Rappaport's home, and his Hasidim are scandalized. Um, he said, they said, can you trust the house that's kosher? They, 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 they're, they've been seen not keeping Shabbos there. And uh, Rappaport has a son-in-law named Hishber Horovitz, very interesting figure. And Nachman finds them very fascinating and very attractive. And he begins having conversations with them. They talk about mathematics. They play chess together. Um, the Hasidim are absolutely scandalized. But Nachman says, these people understand me better than you do. And um, exactly what happened between Nachman and the Maskelim, we don't know. Did they read him Western literature? Did he... Nachman seems always to have been curious about everything. He, 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 drank, in, he drank in reading like a, like, a kind of, like a kind of filter. And did they read him Western literature? It seems like they may have. Here's Ber Horowitz, just to give you a piece of 19th century Jewish history. Here's Ber Horowitz, the young Maske whom Nachman meets and, and, and debates and likes. Um, 20 years later, after Nachman dies, opens the first opens the first uh, school for, um, for Jewish children in the Ukraine where they teach in Russian and where they, try to, where they try to assimilate them. He then disappears. We don't know what happened to him. But in the 1840s, he shows up as Herman Bernard in England, lecturer in Hebrew at the University of Cambridge and a recent convert to the religion of our Lord because in order to teach at Cambridge, you have to be a Christian. And so he's baptized and he becomes Herman Bernard. Just interesting. And we have documents written by him in that, in that later, in that later guy. It gives you a sense of the journeys the Jews went through in the early 19th century. So Nachman is there. Nachman is there for a year. And uh, we have a very vivid description of Nachman's death recorded by his disciples um, in 1810. And he's gone. What did the disciples do? There is no son, there is no heir, and Nussan, who has been the faithful disciple all along, refuses to become Rebbe. There were places where the this chief disciple becomes the Rebbe, but not uh, uh, when they're, when, rather than a son. That happened, but not in Breslov. He is there to represent his master, who is somehow still alive. And Nussen keeps uh, Breslov going for the next 35 years.
he publishes, he gets a little printing press in Breslau, he publishes Nachman's work, he writes commentaries on Nachman's work, he writes a huge sort of six-volume work called Selected Laws, Likute uh, Halachot, applying Nachman's teachings to the whole of Jewish practice. And he writes his own autobiography, his own memoir, and he writes the life of Rabbi Nachman, and he writes uh, counsels for ordinary people uh, from the teachings of Rabbi Nachman. And he creates a kind of industry of, of studying, studying Nachman's teachings. Um, only in these two odd groups, Chabad and Breslov, do they really study their own work very seriously. Many Hasidic uh, dynasties put out books. Many Hasidic masters had collections of their sermons, but they weren't studied really intensely. Uh, in Breslov, because there is no Rebbe, you are related to the Rebbe through his writings. So they studied, they studied Nachman's work. They wrote commentaries and super commentaries on Nachman's work, they developed a whole literature of, um, of Breslov teachings. They were, as I said already, fiercely persecuted by the other Hasidim. In the rest of literature, when you see the word misnagdim, opponents, enemies, it doesn't mean anti-Hasidic Jews like it does anywhere else. It means the Hasidic, the other Hasidic groups who were persecuting them. But they survived. They survived as a small, poor group of Hasidim in the southern Ukraine. Uh, Nossen died in 1845. He had two disciples, uh, Nachman of Cherin and Nachman of Tulchin. They were both named Nachman, surprisingly enough. Um, many Jews in the Ukraine were named Nachman after him. And, uh, and they carried on. They published more of, the, more of the books. Oh, there must have been a few hundred families, not more. Uh, the Yiddish novelist um, uh, Der Nister, um, around 1910, published a novel that takes place in Berdichev, just before the First World War. It's a novel of a family there, three brothers, and one of them is a Breslov Hasid. And he, they des he describes the Breslov Hasid Hasidim of the, of the turn of the century. They're the poorest, most pathetic outcasts in the Jewish community. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't dress decently, they sort of live in, wear, wear, wear rags, they live in the edge of town where, where nobody else would live. They were the poorest of the poor and the most rejected figures in the Jewish community, but always, but always seen as very profound, very committed to their, to their way of life. The idea of confessing your sins to the master did not last very long. People did not, people did not take to it well. Therefore, Nachman created another practice that stood in place of confession. That practice was called Hidbodudut. Hidbodudut, which literally means being alone, is the word used for meditation in Judaism mostly. Hidbodudut is to be alone with God. But Nachman had a particular practice of Hidbodudut that he taught to his disciples. And this became a, a defining act of being a of Hasid. Every day, you are to spend an hour in lone prayer with God. The rules are the following. You must do it alone. Nobody else should be able to hear you. You do it verbally. You talk to God. You talk to God for an hour a day. You must do it in your native language. No Hebrew, if you're, unless you're an Israeli, unless you're a Hebrew speaker. It was, it, was, it was done in Yiddish. You must do it in your native language. And in that hour a day, you must break your heart. The purpose is to break your heart. Shvirat HaLev. The rest of the day, he said, be as happy as you want. Even tell jokes, dance around. Happiness, joy is the most important thing. But for that hour, you are to break your heart. And the... Um, Breslov Hasidim made that an absolute part of their practice. I remember uh, being in Jerusalem oh, many, many years ago uh, before, uh, before the conquest of the old city. You would go, I would go to the uh, neighborhood called Sanhedria, if anybody knows where that is, the graves of the Sanhedrin, and you could hear, you could hear Breslov Hasidim late at night if you walked by, you could hear Breslov Hasidim out there among the graves crying and, and doing their his by this. Um, very impressive. I, I had a privilege of studying with one of the elders of the Breslov community, oh, maybe in 19, early 1970s, Rabbi Gedalia Koenig, 
uh, Zal, and I said to him, uh, so do you really do his this every day, as you do it an hour a day, as Rabbi Nachman said? He said, sometimes only 45 minutes. <laughs> 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 so I, uh, I was curious, I was tickled by that, because I was wondering, at 45 minutes, okay, can you can do it for 50 minutes because then it becomes the 50-minute hour. Um, and that is to say, that is to say, of course, Reb Nachman has something in common with another Jewish healer who lived a century later, not too far away, um, which is to say, if you can say it out loud, if you can verbalize it, it will somehow get better. The talking cure. Um, and so Nachman seems to have stumbled into something like that. Um, you can say it to God. If you're... If your shrink is an old-fashioned Freudian who looks out the window, maybe, you, maybe you're better off talking to God. Um, at least you'll, you'll never hear him snoring. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, good to, it's good to talk to God. And uh, um, uh, as I say, his Bodhidus is a very, it's a very profound religious practice. Um, it can be a tormented practice, obviously, and that book is called Tormented Master, not for no reason. Um, it can be a hard religious practice, but it does, um, it does soften people, it does open the heart, it does make you live uh, with an open heart in a very dramatic way. And I think the Breast of Hasidim, the old Breast of Hasidim certainly have that. And uh, there, is a, there is a kind of... Uh, a kind of openness and tolerance about them because they've been through all this religion of suffering. Uh, so they, um, they remained a very small group, as I say, a very small and very poor group. They were located in the southern Ukraine, and then, of course, the most terrible thing you can imagine happened to them, you could imagine until then happened to them, and that was the Russian Revolution. And they were almost completely destroyed uh, under, the, under the communist regime because they were... They were weak and disorganized. Chabad became very strong. Chabad fought. Uh, Chabad had an underground in the Soviet Union that preserved Jewish life very dramatically for, the, for, 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 for a period of 30 or 40 years. Breslov did not have that. And they were almost completely destroyed. There were a few people. There were certain secrets in Breslov that were handed down from generation to generation. There were certain books of Rabbi Nachman's that had never been published. Thing is called the Sefer Aganuz, the hidden book, which was handed down from one person to another, generation after generation, in the little group of maybe of maybe a, 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 a hundred or fewer, even fewer, real Braslev Hasidim who survived in the Soviet Union, and a few of them came out. A uh, few of them came out and wound up in Eretz Yisrael. What happened was, um, by the turn of the 20th century, there was a Breslev community in Jerusalem. And that was probably the strongest, after the Russian Revolution, that was the strongest center of Breslov. And, um, and they preserved a lot of the traditions. In interwar Poland, there was a sudden revival of Breslov Hasidim. There were a few people who had learned Breslov, who had studied Reb Nachman. There had never been Breslov Hasidim in Poland. It was a strictly Ukrainian sort of certain region of the Ukraine. But in the interwar period, there was a revival of interest in Breslov in Poland and several, several leading disciples. And there were probably a few thousand Rest of Hasidim in Poland before the war. And they were completely wiped out. Um, a few people of the of the Ukrainian of the Ukrainian uh, Brestovers survived and came to came to Eretz Yisrael after the war. Um, of course the area was completely the Jews in the area were completely destroyed. Uh, Nachman's grave. Nachman's grave was a place of pilgrimage. Nachman said when he was going to be buried in Uman, whoever comes to my grave, especially on Rosh Hashanah, I will pull him out of hell by the payas if I have to, but I will save him. And that promise became a very important piece of Breslov. So therefore, pilgrimage to Nachman's grave was a very important act, along with his bread of this every day and the recital of certain psalms, which Nachman said would help atone for your sins. Um, pilgrimage to the grave of Rabbi Nachman was very important. Well. Um, that went on even when the Soviets forbade it. People would, people would sneak their way to the grave. Um, the few breast of Hasidim who were left sort of bribed various Soviet officials not to build a housing project right on top of the grave. I was, uh, in, uh, I was in the Soviet Union in 1973. I, my wife and I were among those young couples who were, 
sent by the Jewish agency after Russia broke, after the Soviets broke off relations with Israel, um, they would send young American couples for holidays to each major city where there's a Jewish population. We were sent to Kiev in 1973. And uh, Misha, I think I told you this story, didn't I? I got to the synagogue in Kiev the day before Pesach and, uh, and walked in and the Shamus comes, I was in the middle of writing my book on Rabbi Nachman, and the Shamus comes over to me and says, Shalom Aleichem, is that the breast of Rechosid? Um, how, how do you do? Are you a breast of I looked at him like, how did he know I was writing about Rabbi Nachman? But it turned out, who would be crazy enough, what Jew from outside the Soviet Union would be crazy enough to come to the Ukraine in Pesach, when you couldn't get matzah, you couldn't get anything to eat, you couldn't live? I must be one of those crazy breast lovers who was going to Uman to, uh, to, be, to be in Rav Nachman's grave for Pesach. And um, when I first began studying Rabbi Nachman, there were, I believe, five rest of little shtiblach in the world. There was the main rest of synagogue in, uh, in Me'a Sharim, which maybe got a couple of hundred people. And then there were two little other rest of synagogues in Jerusalem, one in Shari Chesed and one in Katamon. There was a minion in Tiberias, and there was one minion in Brooklyn. And that was it. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know of a breast of community in Bnei Brak at that time. Maybe there was. Yes, yes, there was. A, there was a breast of community also in Bnei Brak. So those, those kinds of places. Sometime around 1980, something happened in Breslov. They decided for the first time to reach out to people who were, who were uh, seeking to reach out to people who were not Breslovers they began publishing their books in formats that uh, other Israelis could read. They began, they began conducting classes. They began, they began conducting an outreach campaign. They also had some American Chosrim uh, 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 sort of penitents, who came and began translating Rav Nachman's teachings into English. They established something called the Breslau Research Center. And then they began attracting, attracting people you wouldn't expect. Um, of the 30,000 people who go to Uman today uh, for Rosh Hashanah to go to Reb Nachman's grave, probably almost half are Sephardic Jews, many of them North Africans. Um, a lot of those people are um, former drug addicts who say Reb Nachman helped them sort of, uh, change their lives, uh, former, um, uh, former um, uh, convicts who discovered Reb Nachman in prison. Um, the idea that Reb Nachman will save you Whatever you're going through, Reb Nachman has been through worse, and therefore he can save you, became a very popular kind of rubric for people who needed it for all kinds of other reasons. Uh, he's a little bit, um, I, I think he's a little bit like a Jesus figure in some ways. Um, he, is, he, is the, he is the dead Messiah who can save you. And, uh, and there is something that's, uh, that's familiar about that, about that religion. Um, he's also become something of a Middle Eastern saint, I would say. In Breslov, you don't hear much Yiddish anymore because so many of the people are Sephardic and because it's become so Israeli, 